Hi chemists, we are starting our brand new unit on chemical reactions. And so the purpose of this video is to help you become familiar with some of the symbols and terminology with writing chemical reactions. After today, you should be able to name the diatomic elements, write formula equations given the word equations for the chemical reaction. A chemical equation represents a chemical reaction, and you may know chemical reactions really just as chemical changes that you probably learned about in middle school. We write chemical reactions as if we have the reactants or the things that are reacting together on the left. The arrow is called yield. So we say reactants yield products. And obviously the products is what is written on the right, which is basically what is produced over the course of a reaction. Also, if you have more than one reactant or more than one product on either side of the yield sign, we will separate them with a plus sign. Here are some common forms of reactions. So you could have uh, reactant A uh, with reactant B yields product C. You could have reactant A breaks down to products B and C. Or you could have, for example, reactant A reacting with B to yield C and D. So these are all generic kind of forms of reactions. We'll talk more about how to classify reactions a little bit later on in this unit. Chemical equations are typically written as word equations or formula equations. So formula equations can also be balanced or unbalanced. Let me show you what this looks like. Here's an example of a word equation where the substances are written in words. Notice that you still have plus signs separating multiple reactants and you still have the arrow, which means the yield sign. The formula equation would be exactly what it sounds like where the substances are written in formulas. So you can see everything is written as a formula. You may also notice some different symbols. So you see a little S here, a little G, and another little S. We'll talk about what those are momentarily. This is an example of an unbalanced chemical equation. And when I say unbalanced, it basically just means if you focus on the iron, notice that there's only one iron on the left-hand side, but there are two on the right. And law of conservation says you can't simply just go from one out on iron now to two just magically appearing. So that's why we always have to balance our chemical equations, which again, we'll talk about a little bit later, but I just wanted to show you. We balance equations by putting something called coefficients in front of the substances. So for example, there's four irons over here, and then two times two will also give you four irons on the product side. Notice there's six oxygens, because three times two is six. And then this two in front will also be multiplied by the three over here, so that will give you six oxygens on the right as well. If you're not following that, like I said, don't worry about it. We will definitely get to it a little bit later on. Here are some symbols, and then here are their meanings. So if you have an S, like you saw on the previous slide, that's a solid, L is liquid, and G is gas. AQ means aqueous, which means that substance is dissolved in water. A double-headed arrow means that a reaction is reversible. If you have a triangle or the word heat written over arrows, that means that heat is added to the reaction. And then finally, if you see an arrow and you have a substance written over it, like for example, platinum, that means a catalyst is added and that's a substance that speeds up a reaction. Now, the focus of this video is to talk about how to change word equations into formula equations. And to do this, I have this really helpful flow chart. So if you're reading a word equation and you come across an element, the line of questioning that you need to say in your head is, is the element monatomic or is it diatomic? If the element in question is monatomic, then you're going to simply just write the symbol. So for example, if you were to see the word sodium, then you would write the symbol Na, because that is the symbol for sodium. And you would just find it on your periodic table if you didn't know it. There are certain elements that occur diatomically in nature. So as you might expect, di meaning two. So these are the elements that are diatomic in nature. And you may say, Miss Raz, do I need to memorize all of these? Well, fortunately, um, I can teach you a really easy way to know them. So if you notice, B, R, I, N, C, L, H, O, and F spell out a word. 
So it looks like Brinkelhoff. So this is what I teach my students to remember the diatomic elements. So say to yourself, Brinkelhoff. And I find it's really helpful for students to actually write the word Brinkelhoff on, on top of any test or quiz because it just helps you to remember them because a lot of students forget them. So these are the Brinkelhoff elements. These are the only ones that you're going to have to worry about occur diatomically in nature. So these substances, whenever you see them, are always going to have the subscript of two written. So for example, if you were to see the word bromine in a word equation, you would have to write Br2. If you were to see the word hydrogen, you would have to write H2. Notice diatomic is different than monatomic, right? Since sodium is not in the word Brinkelhoff, that's why we don't write sodium with a two. But don't worry, I'll show you some more examples. Let's say you're reading across and you see that the next substance that you come across is a compound. The line of questioning that you wanna to say to yourself is, well, is the compound ionic or is it molecular? So you can identify an ionic compound because it's made up of a metal and a nonmetal. Ionic compounds, remember, you have to balance the charges, which means that you need to have a net zero charge on the compound. And you did this in your naming and formula writing unit. So for example, if you were to see the words uh, calcium chloride, that's a compound. And you know it because you have two elements put together. So to write the um, formula for calcium chloride, you're going to have to look up the individual charges of calcium and chlorine. And so when you do that, calcium is 2 plus and chloride is 1 minus. Notice that you can't just put them together. You actually need two chloride ions in order to balance out the calcium ion. So therefore, the formula would have to be CaCl2. Now on to molecular. You'll identify if it's a molecular compound if you have two nonmetals put together. In this one, we are only going to use the prefixes to determine the subscripts. We do not care about charges here because remember in molecular compounds, there's no charges forming. They're sharing electrons. So for example, if you were to see dinitrogen tetraoxide, that is telling you that we are looking at N2O4. So you're not gonna wanna forget those prefixes. So let's try some examples. So I have sodium chloride plus fluorine gives you sodium fluoride and chlorine. So the first substance that you see is a compound. And so then you want to think about, okay, what's in the compound flow chart? So sodium is a ionic compound, and we know that because it's a metal and a nonmetal. That means we have to look up the charges. So sodium is plus one, chloride is one minus. Sodium chloride, then, is going to be NaCl. Next up is an element. In the flowchart, you had to ask yourself, is the element monatomic or is it diatomic? Well, guess what? Fluorine is in the word Brinkelhoff. Remember, F is at the end. So because it is in the word Brinkelhoff, you are going to have to write F2. One helpful strategy is keeping your plus signs and your arrows in line. That way you don't miss anything. Kind of like in algebra class, your teacher probably told you to keep the equal signs in line with each other. Next up is sodium fluoride. That's a compound. It is ionic. So you are going to make sure those charges add up to zero. So it'll be Na has a plus one, F has a minus one. So it'll be NaF. And then finally, chlorine, that's an element then you have to say, well, is it monatomic or diatomic? Well, it puts the co in Brinkelhoff, so therefore you are gonna have to write Cl2. Let's try another one. So aluminum is an element, and so you have to think, okay, is it a Brinkelhoff element? Well, guess what? Aluminum is not a Brinkelhoff element, so you do not write a two. Sulfur is up next. It is an element. Again, the word Brinkelhoff tells you what needs a two. Sulfur is not in the word Brinkelhoff. The symbol for sulfur is not in there. So you're just going to write S. And then finally, aluminum sulfide is a compound. It is an ionic compound because it's a metal and a nonmetal. So you'll have to look up those charges. And then you should get Al2S3. As I mentioned, Keeping all substances and their plus signs in line with each other is a really helpful way to make sure that you don't get confused. Let's try one last one. 
So zinc sulfide is a compound. It is an ionic compound because again, it's a metal and a nonmetal. So zinc has a two plus charge. Sulfide is two minus, so it'll be ZNS. Magnesium arsenate is also a compound. It is ionic because it is a metal and a nonmetal. And so it'll be mg 3 aso 4 2 Don't forget to always put parentheses around the polyatomic ion if you need more than one. Zinc arsenate is Zn plus 2. And then again, the arsenate has a minus 3 charge. So it'll be Zn3 aso 4 with a 2 outside the parentheses. And then finally, magnesium sulfide. It is ionic, so we're going to balance those charges. And it'll just be MgS. So um, your teacher may have given you an exit ticket to work on as you kind of go through this unit just to see what you were able to retain. I hope that this was able to help you as you go through and begin our unit on chemical reactions. Thank you so much for watching.